seeing is believing. For those with faith in the traditional sense of the word, believing comes without seeing, without any proof. But for those of us who do not have faith in the more traditional sense of the word, seeing is believing. There's a word in the ancient Sanskrit language that I like. The word is darshan. Darshan means a sight or a vision. It can mean glimpse. Specifically in Hindu worship, darshan is the opportunity to have a glimpse of the divine. Frequently it happens with a temple priest or a guru who can guide you. Darshan often takes the form of a blessing that you might receive in the temple. So in that sense, it's a little bit like the Christian tradition of communion, a chance to commune, have union with the divine. But Hinduism is not a very proscriptive tradition, so it's not so much a requirement that you receive darshan, as one might feel an obligation to receive a sacrament like communion. Darshan is simply something that the devotee craves. The devotee wants to catch a glimpse of the divine, just for its own sake. Naturally, many people from across the ages and from various religious traditions have wanted a divine vision. There's that sense in which it's almost irresistible to see God, if indeed one believes in God, or even if one just wonders if there's a God. But it's often a scary prospect, too. Think of this morning's call to worship from the Hebrew scriptures, the book of Exodus, chapter 33. Moses said to God, I pray you, show me your glory. And God responds, you cannot see my face for no one can see me and live. And so God works out something where Moses gets a partial look, a glimpse of the divine, quite literally. God lets Moses see his back, but not his face. There are other stories, of course, in divine, of divine visions and other traditions. In Hinduism, there's the classic scripture, the Bhagavad Gita part of the much longer Mahabharata. In the Bhagavad Gita, Arjuna is a young man who's born into the warrior caste, and he's riding a chariot into battle. And Arjuna is very troubled because he knows it's going to be a very deadly battle, and it's even going to be fratricidal. He's going to be fighting family in some cases. And so he has this famous conversation about dharma, or duty, with his charioteer. A charioteer who, he finds out, is actually Krishna, the avatar of the divine. At one point in the story, Arjuna asks Krishna to reveal himself in his full divine form. In other words, Arjuna asks to see God the ultimate incarnation of the divine. And Krishna does grant this favor. He does reveal his divine form to Arjuna. According to the Bhagavad Gita, in his full form as the divine, Krishna appears to Arjuna with an infinite number of heads and faces, ornamented by heavenly jewels, displaying unending miracles and countless instruments of his power. In his ultimate form as the divine, Krishna appears as the creator, the sustainer, and the destroyer of all that is. And Arjuna is in awe. And he's also terrified. And Krishna very quickly returns to his human form as a charioteer so that Arjuna is not too overwhelmed. So it would seem a glimpse of the divine is all that us mortals, even mortals as admirable in their traditions as Moses and Arjuna can handle. So say some of the ancient scriptures from some of the world's great religious traditions. 
I don't often talk about it. It's not something that you bring up in casual conversation. But I have seen the divine. So I've got that going for me. <laughs> this is a sermon, so I suppose it is an appropriate time to talk about it. It seems pretty appropriate to talk about a glimpse of what some might call God. But I still hesitate because I didn't see the divine in a temple or a church or even up on a mountaintop or any other exalted locale. And to tell you the tale feels strangely self-indulgent, but I'm going to share the story anyway, because I did have a divine vision. It came on a Thursday. It was August 6th. 2009 at 3.45 p.m. <laughs> My glimpse of the divine happened in Boston on Lansdowne Street. I even have a picture. <laughs> it happened like this. I was in Boston for a concert. I was going to hear Paul McCartney, Sir Paul McCartney, play at Fenway Park and I was pretty excited. Well, that's kind of an understatement. <laughs> I had a great seat, which was in part funded by my mother for my 40th birthday. Row 17, to be exact, not too shabby. I was so jazzed to see Paul in concert, and it was just the second time that I'd ever seen him perform live. So I came into Boston early to make a day of it. I caught an early train into town, and I came alone because you don't really want to come to a Paul McCartney concert with me. <laughs> I came in early because of course I didn't want to be late. I didn't want to have to mess with parking. I had butterflies in my stomach. I was so kind of excited about it all. And so I was in Boston early, happily killing time outside of the ballpark, looking at overpriced Red Sox souvenirs and overpriced Paul McCartney souvenirs. I even spent some time listening to some really bad Beatles-only karaoke in a bar before the concert. Things like that. I'm easily entertained. So I'm just wandering around, now on Lansdowne Street, and I see a handful of suspiciously intense-looking Paul McCartney fans. I spot them because they're wearing things like specially made t-shirts that say, Nancy loves Paul. <laughs> or they're wearing yellow submarine pants. <laughs> Subtle clues like that. <laughs> and you know, they also had that look. You know, that slightly squirrely look of somebody a little bit obsessed. Maybe about a dozen people were there, right across from the House of Blues. Maybe you know the spot. And my intuition told me, stand with these squirrely people. They know something. <laughs> so I strike up a conversation with Nancy of the Nancy Loves Paul t-shirt and with Frank of the yellow submarine pants. They were there actually the day before for the first of his two concerts at Fenway Park. And Nancy told me that the day before, Paul McCartney had driven into Fenway at that very gate where we were standing at around 3.15 p.m. But today, she said, he'd probably be a little later since, you know, the sound check wouldn't take as long the second day. It will happen like this, Nancy said. Sir Paul and his people will become driving in a big black car, following a couple of police officers on motorcycles, driving the wrong way down the one-way Lansdowne Street. It will happen like this, Nancy said. Sir Paul will be on our side of the street, sitting behind the driver, and guess what? At 3.45 p.m., it all came to pass, just as Nancy had said, just as it had been revealed to me. And there I was, mere feet away from my lifelong idol. And it actually was, and I'm not exaggerating, an out-of-body experience. I knew I wanted to take a picture, even though all I had was my cell phone camera. But somehow I had the presence of mind to make sure that I made eye contact 
with Paul first. And I did. I made eye contact with Paul McCartney. <laughs> I was looking at him and he was looking at me, just for a split second. And I waved and I yelled to him what I wanted to say to him since I was four years old. <laughs> Paul! <laughs> right back. <laughs> and then and only then did I snap a photo with my lowly cell phone camera just after my split second of eye contact. Do you want to see the picture? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's a little blurry. have this in my wallet or anything. <laughs> you know, I'm glad I have that picture even though it's a little blurry because otherwise I would think the whole thing was just a dream. See is worse now than seeing is believing in this era of ubiquitous cell phone cameras picture or it didn't happen. <laughs> so I'm guessing that some of you are sitting there thinking, that's not really a divine vision. And no, I'm not saying that Paul McCartney is God. <laughs> but you must understand the extent of my adoration for the man. One of my early memories is watching Saturday morning cartoons like we all did. And right after Scooby-Doo or something like that, there was that special presentation in those days before, you know, DVDs and Netflix. And they showed the movie Yellow Submarine right there after the Saturday morning cartoons. And since it looked like another cartoon, I just kept watching. And I was hooked. Four years old and hooked on the Beatles. That was easily the trippiest cartoon I had ever seen. <laughs> but I loved it. I loved the music. I loved the four little personalities. And I liked all of the Beatles. But my favorite from day one was Paul. I don't know why. He just was. The first album I ever bought a few years later was, in fact, the soundtrack for Yellow Submarine. And I collected every one of the Beatles albums one by one, saving all my pennies like you do, reading every biography of them I could find. My adoration of the Beatles, especially Paul, was so intense and so complete that it threw my family and my friends off the scent of my lesbianism all through my adolescence. <laughs> Unbeknownst to him, Paul McCartney was my celebrity beard for 20 years. <laughs> but I worshipped Paul from first sight in his avatar form on Yellow Submarine back in 72 when I was four. And there I was in 2009, 36 years later, a grown woman of 40 making eye contact with him. It's hard to put into words, but it was a, it was a divine vision because it was like my life to that point passed before my eyes and in a flash, all that was good and right in the world, everything I loved in the world was sort of encapsulated in that moment in time. Here was this singular being in the universe that I'd wanted to see since I was four, right in front of me, closer than anyone in this room is to me right now. It was as powerful a feeling of euphoria as I've ever known. It was bliss, and I can tell you, and I don't say this in a humorous way at all, I'm quite serious. I can tell you that I felt in that moment absolutely connected. I felt connected to everything I'd ever experienced up to that point in my life. I felt connected to the kind stranger, Nancy, who had selflessly shared Darshan with me that afternoon by telling me to stay right there, to catch a glimpse. I felt connected to everyone who ever loved music or any particular artist. 
I felt connected to everyone, whoever took the, the time to smile and wave at somebody else simply because they were a human being. I felt connected to it all. I felt connected to existence itself. Words never do it justice because for me it was a mystical experience. It was profound. And I'm convinced that everyone can have a divine vision, a glimpse of the glory that makes you feel connected to all that is, to all that was, to all that ever will be, a hint of eternity. I believe that everyone can experience this feeling. Maybe some of you already have. The Reverend Dr. Gail and Guggenrich, Senior Minister of All Souls Unitarian Church in New York City, puts it this way. I believe that God exists like beauty exists, but not like a person or an apple exists. An apple is a physical object. You can pick off a tree, cut into slices, bake in a pie, and serve warm with vanilla ice cream. God, in contrast, is like beauty. Beauty itself never appears to us, but we find the description necessary to account for our delight in the symmetry and form of certain objects, certain experiences, sunsets, symphonies, sculptures by Degas. He concludes, we also need a word for the unification of all the experiences in the universe. And that word, for some, is God. That's what my divine vision was for me. A glimpse of God, for lack of a better word, in the form of an experience that made me feel the unification of all other experiences I'd ever have. This morning, in closing, I ask you to consider divine visions you might have in your own life. Have you already had one? What was it? As the Reverend Lynn Unger, Minister of Lifespan Learning at the UUA's Church of the Larger Fellowship puts it, if you were going to look for God, where would you look? Would you go up to a mountain? Would you look in the crashing ocean waves? Would you look upward at the stars or downward at the earth that supports you? Maybe, she writes, you would look for God in your favorite piece of music. You might want to look for God in a painting or a dance. You might very well look for God in a soup kitchen where people who have very different lives connect. Wherever you looked, how would you know if you had found God? No one knows what God looks like, but really, we all know that God doesn't look like any particular thing, she goes on. We all have moments of awe and wonder and times of deep gratitude. We know that life is somehow connected, that each of us belongs to something much bigger than our own individual selves. God, she says, is just a word. It's not a bad thing to have a little word package to stuff those ideas of connection and wonder and broader life into. Sometimes you need a word to start a conversation. And really, it's the conversation about what most deeply connects us, what, do, what most deeply moves us. That's what matters. In his Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. May we all have the purity of heart to see the divine in the world and the creatures and the faces all around us, day after day. May it be so. Blessed be and amen.